I am wondering if we could take just a couple of minutes and open in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the privilege of being here today. Thank you that you yourself planned this day before the worlds were made. Thank you for your strong love, for your imagination, for your poet maker self, that you bring all things into existence through your word. Through the words of your mouth, you make reality. Thank you. Thank you that you've taken the time, taken the energy, the thought, to um, speak each one of us into existence, and that you have planned an astonishing life for each one of us. I invite you into this place, acknowledge that you are the host, that you are king, that you are companion, that you are guide, and that you are our destiny. Thank you for this. We ask you to open our hearts and minds and our inner ears that we would hear your word being spoken and that you would free us to go out and create afterwards. We love you and we worship you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So happy to see all of you. Um, Brian and I started talking about doing this session many, many months ago, and I told him what I thought I might want to explore is some, a couple of possible topics, and he sent me an interesting title that he thought he should, um, maybe, that I would maybe add on to doing this, which was Magic as Discipleship. And I thought long and hard about that, um, because it is an interesting turn of phrase. So. I think as we start, I'd like you to do um, a little bit of pretending with me. Uh, we spent all day listening to um, the influence of imagination and hearing, hearing about that, so I want you to actually exercise yours um, right now. So if you don't mind, take a second, maybe, maybe 30 seconds, and close your eyes. Close your eyes. Good job. I want you to imagine that we are not in this beautiful chapel together right now, but that rather we are standing kind of huddled up together in our good walking clothes with walking sticks and backpacks, and that we're about to set out on a walking tour. I want you just to take a minute to imagine what you're wearing. Um, what kind of shoes are you wearing for a cross-country walk? What kind of a walking stick do you have? Do you have a backpack? Is it leather? Is it canvas? What's that like? What do you have inside of it? We're going to do a cross-country walk through some land that you're already familiar with. But we're going to go through this land a little bit differently. So imagine right now, are we with a big group? Are we with all of us together? Or is it just you and me, and we're gonna go out hiking across um, this new ground? Can you picture that in your mind's eye? Okay. What I'm gonna do today, you can open your eyes, unless you're really tired, but I need you to wake up. <laughs> what we're gonna do today is not really a tromp through a foreign country. I'm not going to take you someplace that you don't know. What I am going to do is hopefully take you someplace that you think you know and maybe help you see it a little bit differently. Sometimes we drive places and we don't really see what's around us. You heard Brian talk about that this morning. I thought that was really cool that he used that as the example for his own looking because it was already built into mine and I didn't know what he was going to say. Sometimes when we go a different direction, we see things that are familiar but we see them brand new. So when we set out on our walking tour together, um, in your mind's eye, 
Um, the, one of the things I want you to look for in your backpack that we're going to use is our map. Words themselves are maps. I use words very carefully when I look at um, how I approach reading, how I approach study, how I approach language. Every word, if you look at it and unpack it, especially if you look at etymology, has a whole history of meaning. Words are astonishing things because God created them out of the essence of himself. But those words, have, even when we don't have the modern meaning, the meaning that we have now, we may not remember what the whole history of the word is, but the meaning of the word has followed it throughout time. So words that had meaning in Rome that still carries that power with it even now, even though we don't know what they are. Um, so I always try to take a hard look at the words that we use because it's so easy to think that we actually already know when, in fact, we don't. The first word in this session that I really want us to take the good, long, hard look at is the word magic. Magic, um, especially for Christians, can sometimes be seen as a dangerous word um, and maybe threatening, maybe theologically um, not appropriate. What do I mean by the word magic? I think that's really important to set that out from the beginning. The meaning of the word that I am using in this context for this trip either makes it a really dangerous one, meaning I would be leading you astray, or I'd be leading you to someplace enchanting. What I mean by the con in this context today is something that produces a state of wonder or awe. But the kind of awe that we're talking about here isn't the kind of awe you feel when you're looking at a star-studded night sky and you feel how small you are. It's not the awe you feel looking at your newborn baby. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. She's got it. Some of you already know this word. The word is numinous. In English, numinous, supernatural, and magic are used as synonyms for each other. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as having a strong religious or spiritual quality, indicating or suggesting the presence of a divinity. The word numinous comes from the Latin root word numen. It means the spirit or divine power presiding over a place. What Newman meant in Roman times was that it was the divine nod of power or acknowledgement. Properly, it was the divine approval expressed by nodding the head. What it meant was that it was recognition by the gods. Rudolf Otto is a Lutheran um, phenomenologist. Isn't that a cool word? <laughs> phenomenologist. I thought maybe I wouldn't be able to say it, but it's awesome that I could. He wrote a book titled The Idea of the Holy. This book um, was really important. C.S. Lewis lists it um, in the top 10 books that influenced him. In The Idea of the Holy, Otto explores the phenomena in the numinous um, in context of religious experience. It's a, the encountering of the immediate presence of the divine. It's not talking to, he's not talking about something that makes you feel um, a sense of delight. It's not about a sensory impulse. This is about encountering the presence of someone other, other with a capital O. Someone not human, presence beyond humanity. In all the times that people have numinous experiences, they are aware of being in the presence of someone greater than themselves. Otto called it mysterium tremendum, the tremendous mystery. This book had an incredible influence, as I mentioned, on Lewis, and you will find the influence of the book feeding through almost all of C.S. Lewis's work. 
He wasn't the only person that Otto influenced, but I'm especially interested in how it influenced Lewis because that thread from Otto is what speaks to each of you today because you wouldn't be interested in this session if this wasn't already drawing you. That work shows up in Narnia. Do you remember when they're sitting there at the beavers and they're at the table and they've never heard the word Aslan before, they don't know who that is? They, and remember how some of them, Peter, Susan, and Lucy, each had like some response and it thrilled them and for Edmund, it created the sense of horror. That's one of the places where you get to see not only the experience of the numinous, but you also get to see how a writer has taken that experience and translated it into a creative communication so that other people could experience it also. It's really interesting that he could take an idea as Abstract's the wrong word. Uh, but an idea that is so big and so profound, but he's able to translate that into a language that children would recognize. Madeline Lengel does it um, easily. We all, you know, like wind in the door, um, wrinkle in time. She captures those same kinds of feelings. Lewis's, um, concept of the numinous shows up in the problem of pain. He wrote it in 1940. It was published then. When he gave his great sermon, The Way to Glory, in 1941, this whole concept comes to a complete and full head. Um, you hear it in everything um, that, that filters through that whole sermon. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Human beings have four responses um, possible to the call and the presence of holiness. I have seen all four of them in people in my lifetime, and I suspect you have too. Some people respond with resistance and um, refusal of it, that it's not there, it's a, a bit of rotten potato. Remember that in Scrooge? Some will be drawn to the mystery and the power of it, but they want to control it for themselves. Those are people who oftentimes are drawn to the dark arts and to the occult. I've known many people. Um, I came from Boulder. And um, so I've known many people drawn to this kind of thing. Um, I was too at one time. Some will be drawn, um, they simply deny that it exists because it's just too threatening. So there's a kind of an apathy and then some will find that their hearts leap in recognition and an overwhelming longing. There is probably not a single person in this room that does not know the taste of this already. Um, we are fundamentally made for wonder. We think that experiences about encountering the numinous are like a once in a lifetime kind of experience, something that happens where you don't really expect it and um, it's there, it's fleeting, it leaves a kind of a thumbprint on your mind, on your spirit, that you go through the rest of your life probably never being able to find that experience again. I can tell you that that is not the case. Do you remember how people talk about how um, once they went, they read Narnia, they kept looking around every corner to see if there was a chance they could find um, a door into Narnia? This is very much the same kind of a thing, except that this is actually the real thing. I would venture to bet that probably half of you have already had an encounter with the numinous. Something that was holy that you couldn't explain that was supernatural. It usually only lasts for a few minutes, but how many of you would say that you've been in a place that felt so holy that it made you shake? Holy places are definitely real. They sometimes call them thin places. The place where the veil between earth and heaven is especially thin. I would be so impressed if I could tell you that I knew why that happens, but I actually have no idea. I do know that it is true, and I've experienced that, and I am sure that most of you have, and those of you that think you haven't, you probably still will. 
That being said, the numinous experience is something that I believe God gives to us as the nod of the divine. Nod of holiness means to say, I see you and I approve of you. That's why we have that experience. It's why when we read it in literature, everything in us moves. It's the inconsolable longing. Lewis talks about it in The Weight of Glory, and I'm sure that's, I say this over and over, but it's such an important part of literature to read that and know how much is consolidated. Um, do you mind handing out? It's the first one that says numinous. And maybe just split it up and send it down two rows. I brought little presents for you. So when, so when I do workshops, um, I always bring prints, something for you to take home um, and remember, because I know you're not going to remember your notes. And I'm pretty positive you mostly won't remember anything I say. So I'm not too concerned if you remember what I say. I am really concerned that you remember what the Lord is giving to you. And I want you to get something you can actually use and be nourished by later. Um, and remembrance is a really important part of the way that we grow. So that was the first one. Um, numinous experience is experienced in a couple of different ways. I mean, obviously there's a lot of different instances of it, but we either have first-hand experience. Some of us actually have second-hand experience because we've heard somebody else who's had a numinous experience, and you can tell by the way people talk about it about whether it was real. Because don't they all sound kind of the same? They, they do. There's a certain look in people's eyes when they try to describe it. Their eyes will mist over. Their voice gets really choked up. I've never seen anybody who has seen it, actually seen an angel, like an actual from heaven angel. They have a voice of reverence. All of them do. It, it doesn't matter if they are Christian, if they are filled with the Holy Spirit, if they are unchurched, if they have never heard the word that there are other beings besides human beings, the, at least from my observation, I, I would certainly not say that I think that those experiences are specific to Christians um, or specific to pre-Christians. I mean, it's God nods to whom he nods. and. I know when I listen to people recount their stories about those kinds of encounters, they are never the same, ever. They're never, and I'm not saying that their character changes, because oftentimes it doesn't. I mean, you've seen people who've had inexplicable experiences, and they still do the same dumb things. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that they're they're magically transformed because God nodded and said, I know you. But what does change is their interior direction. That is permanently changed. And it's not changed by their will. It's changed because they've come in contact for some moment like, a, like with a magnet. And the direction of that life is altered because they become aware, we become aware, that there is something more than what we see with our physical eyes. In Otto's book, it's pretty heavy reading, so I wouldn't say, run right out, guys, and get that book, because, you know, a lot of it is, it is um, complicated reading. It was written nearly 100 years ago, and it's not casual reading. But one of the interesting things that comes out of that book is that he, the human experience of the numinous is considered something called primary datum. It's primary data. It means that it cannot be taught. Awareness of it can only be awakened in the mind. That means that some people are having, would have an encounter with the numinous 
And if there was no previous preparation for being aware of that possibility, they wouldn't know that they were there. They wouldn't even know that it was present. Awareness of it can only be awakened in the mind. So I'm going to submit to you that this is one of the great roles of literature, to awaken the mind to an awareness of the holy and the divine that might not be recognized in the ordinary passing of day-to-day -day life. Literature is God whispering his own voice, his own calling to us, and saying that there is something more. There's more. Look up. Look up. Literature can help give words and some definition to the thing that we most long for and that in this world remains the most elusive. Encounters with the numinous presence of the holy have a lifelong transformative effect. And where we oftentimes see it show up in literature is scripture, it's in fairy tales, and it's in poetry, but it also shows up in great essays. Where many of us have seen this already written about is scripture itself. You can think of probably um, a dozen instances in, in the Bible where people have had an encounter with the divine, starting with Abraham. The one that we think about probably the most, though, is Moses at the burning bush. When Diana and I were talking about this, she said, you know, you should illustrate this and just do your talk barefoot. I'm going, I would do that, but it's so hard for me to get my boots back on that I'm not sure it's really worth the effort. <laughs> you know, so imagine me standing here barefoot, and I'll, I'll count on you to make, <laughs> make my life a little easier. Moses standing on holy ground. That's one of the places where I really think about it, because it is so easy for me to imagine that situation. Um, Moses going up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. He's spending 40 days with the Lord God Almighty. When he comes down, his face is shining white, like he's glowing. What would that be like? I often think about that because when we talk about the influence of suffering and adversity in our lives, we talk about this in context of God purifying us and burning out the dross, the impurities, so that someday we reflect God's holiness like silver and gold. Apparently, that already worked that way with Moses. So I always find that it's really striking. God gave us that picture like really early on. But it also shows up with Elijah and the still small voice with Daniel seeing the end of days, with shepherds meeting um, angels the night that Yeshua was born. Every one of the disciples watching Christ's miracles had an encounter with the numinous, and you can really see it because, again, their character didn't change overnight, but their direction in life was permanently altered. The story of Paul on the Damascus Road, that's a moment of it. In every one of those instances, those individuals experience something outside of themselves. One of the key things that I think about for us as people who are creative, people who are people of imaginative power, um, is that we have a calling to be able to share a vision of something beyond us with other people. I want you just to be thinking about it. Maybe make a note in your own in your own notes. How does literature act as a conduit of imaginative truth? I am not going to try to answer that for you. I mean, I could make a I could make an effort, but I don't think you need my answer nearly as much as you need your own. So I, want, I do want you to think about that for a little bit. And maybe ask God to keep talking to you about um, how literature functions that way. I want to read you something that's had a huge influence on me over the years. 
and it captures the way that n the numinous is described in literature. I mean, it's, it's demonstrated here. So this is a little section from The Weight of Glory. It says, we do not merely want to see beauty, though God knows even that bounty is enough. We want something else which can hardly be put into words to be united with the beauty we see, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become part of it. That's why we have peopled air and earth, water, with gods and goddesses and nymphs and elves, that though we cannot, yet these projections themselves can enjoy the beauty and grace and power which nature is the image. This is why the poets tell us such lovely falsehoods. They talk as if the west wind could really sweep into the human soul, but it can't. They tell us that beauty born of murmuring sound will pass into a human face, but it won't. They tell us this, and it won't, or not yet. For if we take the imagery of scripture seriously, if we believe that God will one day give us the morning star and cause us to put on the splendor of the sun, then we may surmise that both ancient myths and modern poetry, so false as history, may very, be very near the truth as prophecy. At present, we are on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door. We discern the freshness and purity of morning, but they do not make us fresh and pure. We cannot mingle with the splendors that we see, but all the leaves of the New Testament are wrestling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. I've loved that passage since the very first time I ever read it. I've probably read it 50 times, maybe more. That's C.S. Lewis. It's from his sermon, The Weight of Glory. And this is a super old copy that mine is probably falling apart because I've underlined it, dog-eared it. Lewis would be appalled if he saw any of my books because he didn't need to dog ear anything or underline anything or draw little signs or smiley faces or crying eyes or hearts or stars, and I do that in all of mine. So when I'm dead and somebody inherits my library, this is what you're gonna get. Sorry, Jay, because that's really how that's gonna work out. Um, what I wanna lead into with all of this, because you have the experience of the numinous, you have literature because you're a room full of readers, or you would not be here, uh, even you. Yeah, uh-huh, it's true. Imagination is not a flight of fancy. It is not uh, a mechanism in our minds used to just escape. The most important thing that we can know about imagination is that, like reason, it is a truth-bearing faculty. If you use only the left side of your brain, which is your, the side that re, re, is reason, it's logic, you will only understand half the truth. Can you really live fully with only half the truth? No, we're not made that way. We were made to be a whole being, and part of our whole being means to have the other side of the brain engaged. Malcolm Geit is somebody you'll hear a lot of us refer to. He's doing amazing work um, related to works on the imagination. He is a poet, um, but also a profound teacher, um, and a marvelous writer, and a wonderful friend. Um, in his book, his new book, Mariner, which is a biography of uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He talks about Coleridge's work 
with the theology of imagination, I strongly urge you to get it and read it because there's nothing out there on this anywhere like it. One of the things that Malcolm Geith said, though, and it just encapsulates everything so beautifully, is that imagination allows us to see or grasp something we haven't grown into. So this is a concept from Coleridge. He talks about it being the sacred self-intuition, something that is planted in us to see a future self and then to take steps to leave room inside of us for that to grow. He, and this is Coleridge who's talking about it. He uses the example of a chrysalis and a horned fly going into the chrysalis, going into dormancy, and yet in the formation, the hardcore formation of the chrysalis, so there's the body, and then it leaves a space space for something that has not even been formed. It leaves room for new antennae. And effectively, imagination allows us to do the self same thing. When we are actually using our imagination the way that we're created to, we allow God to create inside of us space for the selves that we are yet becoming. That is something that needs tender care and faithful care. If you are building something and you want to leave room for self that you are yet to become, you, you don't want to get distracted at a certain point and then leave off and it's like half built, right? So what I'm talking about is effectively making room in yourselves for spirit, practicing a spiritual discipline a spiritual discipline of feeding your imagination, of building it, and acknowledging that that is part of your God-given being. It's part of um, what makes you godlike, made in the image of God. It's not that you look just like him, but you have capacities that are very similar. So is imagination safe? Does anybody wrestle with that? Have you ever struggled with that idea? I have struggled with that idea. And we know lots of Christians, I think. Maybe there are other faith traditions that struggle with those issues, but my concerns are with Christians specifically. So I look at us and think, how many people are afraid to imagine? Afraid that it'll lead you to the wrong places? I so appreciated what Andrew Peterson said this morning. Um, the idea that God could take um, the imaginative work of people who were not completely um, pointing toward heaven and that that material, Tolkien would call it leaf mold. Are you familiar with that term? It's, uh, mold would be M-O-U-L-D. But it's the product that falls into your mind, that out of which your creative works will later come. So all your reading, good or bad, becomes part of that compost, because that's really what he's talking about. But he's referring to the kind that forms naturally in English forests. Um, and so it's something he would be well familiar with. But I love the fact that Andrew talked about the fact that those things that he read and loved as a boy later became part of the furniture, so to speak, of what would, would furnish his mind with other things that are strong and true and good. It's really important to be able to trust God enough to say that the things that you have loved, that there was something good in them, even if they weren't perfect. If there's art that has moved you and it wasn't Christian, it's okay to love it because it still reflects something of God the Father as he calls you home. As Christians, we can afford such a lavish range of love. It doesn't have to be, taking the narrow road that Jesus is calling us to does not mean making a road so narrow that you leave out all of art, all of literature, all of beauty, all of dance, 
all of music, that's not the narrow road the Lord is talking about. And it's really pivotal for us to understand that and have the permission of God the Father to be able to love those things freely and let the Holy Spirit filter what's good and true and beautiful out from the things that are not. Because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You have to be discerning about what you're going to choose to look at, but it doesn't mean that you have to be afraid to take part of things that you're drawn to. One of the things that I have um, appreciated most, maybe from um, C.S. Lewis, is that he's so eminently quotable. Um, and he said, um, I'm just going to run with what you said. Um, my fi one of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis is, for me, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. So you have to have both if you're going to be able to take both in. I think one of the things that I wanted to say to make sure that you hear this is that if you are a new creature in Christ, and God is at work in you and in your imagination and in your spirit and in your loves and in your friendships and in the way that you eat and in the way that you sleep. He sees you as a whole being, the way that you were fully created to be. I so appreciate the way that God speaks about this in 1 Corinthians. He says, for who among men know the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. I'm going to link that with another passage in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4.18. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are unseen are trans for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Same difference, what we're really talking about is that it is the spirit that allows us to see what is invisible, but is also eternally lasting. The reason that I think all of this actually matters, it's not just about how we end up in terms of, of how we get to where we're going, it's also about the way that we shape our relationships with other people. The reason that I started out with the, the statement about magic as discipleship, change the word and say the numinous as discipleship. If you do not understand where you are going, if you don't understand, if you don't have even this, a, a, a tiny wisp of understanding why, you will go through motions, but it will never lead to a complete transformation. And is there anybody in here that doesn't want to be transformed? I don't want to remain in this form. I want to be transformed into the being I feel I am on the inside. I want that to be on the outside. I want you to be able to see that. I want to be able to see that. Discipleship the word disciple comes from the word discipline. The modern understanding of the word discipline is punishment. But in its origin, that was never what it meant. What it meant was training. It was a good thing. It was how soldiers train. It was about a, a, a regular, mechanized, uh, methodical way of controlling behavior to produce a specific result. Now what it means is somebody who's an ardent follower of someone else and is willing to teach the same things that they teach, oftentimes associated with Christ. I'm quoting the dictionary. <laughs> so 
from that standpoint, when I look at the issue about how we live with the numinous and why we even want to deal with those issues, it's because everything that we do is concerned with how we live now and how we live in eternity. And every single one of us is in process of influencing others. Everyone. At the end of Weight of Glory, which probably you all have heard um, so many times because it's so f famous, when he talks about you have never met an ordinary mortal, I want to just go back to this one little tiny part of it, because this is the thing I think about every day. It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature, which if you say it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, in some degree, we are helping one another to one or the other of those destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. If you boil that down, it's the trigger point for all the ways that we treat each other. I want you to have the strongest sense of what a glorious being you are destined to be. And I want to be able to help you take, take another step today toward that. I want to take all the mystery and all the things that I've loved, all that is beautiful, all that's good, all that's true, and make sure that I've reminded you that that's where you are going, that's where you are called to, that's your identity. That's the same for each, each of us, that's our call. When I think about discipleship, I am thinking about the way that we each shape each other, whether it's more toward heaven or whether by our neglect or our hardness of heart or disinterest that we help people toward hell because it is one or the other. And it is, there is a, Jesus talks more about hell than he talked about heaven. I don't know if you've ever looked at that in scripture, but it's very sobering. So there's a mandate on the way that we treat each other, and this is part of the mandate of creating art out of this context. So I'm circling back to that, and I want to read you one thing from Chesterton. And then I'm gonna have us do something different. I'm gonna have us break up into little groups and we're gonna do some questions and explore some of this because I would much prefer that you leave with your own answers than vaguely trying to remember anything that I actually said. I love this from Chesterton and it strongly influenced Lewis also. You've probably heard it. Fairy tales are not responsible for producing in children fear or any shapes of fear. Fairy tales do not give the child the idea of evil or the ugly. That is in the child already, because it's in the world already. Do you remember the controversy about you shouldn't read fairy tales to children because it teaches them to be afraid of the bogey? Fairy tales do not give the child his first idea of the bogey. What fairy tales give the child is his first clear idea of the possible defeat of the bogey. The baby has known the dragon intimately ever since he had an imagination. What the fairy tale provides for him is a Saint George to kill the dragon. If you think about imaginative literature or imaginative art or music, doesn't that give you the sense, doesn't it remind you 
that we have a way of defeating the dragons? That there's a reason to engage? If there's no way to kill dragons, then why would we fight? Why would we go on creating? There is a way, and it's not futile. We don't create in vain. We don't write beautiful music for nothing. It's not about gain here. It's about creating the kingdom of heaven um, and furnishing it. We'll see these things later at home. I know we will. I'm fully expecting strawberry jam from your house in heaven. Pretty positive. I would like you to take a little bit of time. I want to um, explore <clears throat> some of the ways that you, I want you to have some time to explore ideas about what you've heard today. I don't want you to go through and have heard so much stuff you can barely process it. Um, but I am going to close with a, a comment about this before we break into to groups and explore some questions, because I know that you're all tired and I can feel it. It's like sleep is coming. But it can't come for 45 minutes. <laughs> Actually, it would be 43 minutes. So you have to stay awake for 43 minutes. <clears throat> One of the things I'm going to tell you, if you haven't already read The, read the Weight of Glory, is simply that do you know how we talk about that when we, are go, when we go home, that we enter into glory? <clears throat> May he rest in peace and rise in glory. You know that expression? There are two meanings to the word glory, two, two things that are implied. One of them is splendor and light. It means to shine like the sun. The other is like adventure stories and fables from old, where the Greek hero fought to the death against insurmountable odds in order that his name would never be forgotten and he would be a man of renown. Do you remember the word renown? We don't get that word very much. The most that we're gonna get is like 15 seconds uh, on a Twitter feed and the idea of renown is like not likely to be something most of us are actually thinking about trying to earn any time in our lifetime. But like Andrea was describing this morning, inside we want to be on a quest. I do. I want to have like really cool swords, two of them, you know, so that in like cool scenes in the movies, like the Prince of Persia, where he pulls out the swords from the back. Oh my gosh, that's so awesome. I want to be like that. I definitely don't want to be like Arwen sitting in the Rivendell embroidering. She got a crummy deal in that book. That's all I can say. She did not have anything interesting happen. I do not want to be embroidering. I want to do something that involves swords, although the chances are I'd be like so sad if I saw something I couldn't kill it. So it just sounds cool mostly. But that being said, when we think about glory, and this is what Lewis talks about in The Way to Glory also, the other meaning is renown, that when we rise in glory, we are rising known. We are renowned in heaven. Like we have a reputation. You are making a reputation in heaven now. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. I want each of us to find ways to cultivate each other's reputations. I want you to help guard each other so that you can be defending your fellowship. <clears throat> 